Hi, this is Bob Brown, and uh, this is uh, a continuing business study of the confrontation in North Dakota between the uh, pipeline and the Lakota people and environmental activists. And this is uh, in light of the fact that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has announced on December 5th, 2016, they're going to... Um, uh, basically cordoned off the area the protesters are on and then and then they will they will be considered uh, trespassers at that time and uh, just from the offset I I would say that's probably a bad idea because we have to get to a resolution that both sides agree to and it's important that both sides not just one side or the other both sides have got to come to the table and we have to come to a resolution so the Washington Post has an article, and it talks about uh, the Dakota Pipeline Last Stand. In the Dakota language, this is by Stephen Mufson. In the Dakota language, the word ahe signifies a place to stand on, and that's what the Standing Rock Sioux and its allies and environmental activist movements say they're doing using the Lake Ohai, and I apologize to bad pronunciation, North Dakota as a place to stand by to take a stand by setting up camps, obstructing roads to block the controversial 3.7 billion Dakota access pipeline. Uh, the confrontations with police who have responded to water cannons, pepper spray, and rubber bullets to steer attention to the 1,170 mile long pipeline project and its owner, energy transfer pro partners. But the real <coughs> source of Native American grievances stretches back more than a century of the original government incursions in their land. And the earlier rights their land. Um, so I think the Washington Post has Stephen Mufson's hit it right there. This is a culmination of grievances that the people of the Standing Rock Sioux have against outsiders telling them what to do. And in one of my videos, I talk about what I call the millennial uh, upheaval, the millennial revolt. And many of the Standing Rock Sioux, I believe, and the activists who are involved in this are millennials, and they see constant uh, incursions on their rights, and they've had enough. So I want to walk through some concepts of what we're dealing with here and possibly have a, a way out of this problem. The first philosophical concept that you learn as a social scientist is post-positivism. And post-positivism, I'm on Wikipedia, and post-positivism uh, is basically we can really we can really never have as you see here it says uh, epistemology post-positivists believe that human knowledge is based not on unchangeable rock-solid foundation but rather upon human conjectures conjectures as human knowledge is thus unavoidably a conjecture the assertion of these conjectures are warranted more specifically justified by a set of warrants which can be modified or withdrawn in light of further investigation. However, post-positivism post is not a form of relativism and generally retains the idea of objective truth. My understanding of post-positivism as a social scientist in business is that to the best of my ability, I will make observations of science on, and I'm a, doc, I'm a doctor of business administration candidate for IT, so I make observations. I have to understand that I can never become 100% certain that what I'm saying is absolutely true. And that, you always have to remember that. Now, that doesn't mean you don't do anything. You don't go forward. You just have to be aware that you have to look at your unconscious bias, your conscious bias, and all your facts that you have to say to yourself, to the best of my ability, this is what I know, but I have to be constantly questioning and I, and I have to go back to my research in the past because it may, in light of new discoveries, my research may be flawed. <clears throat> so this is one underpinning, <clears throat> excuse me, that the people have, uh, the, the, the Dakota Sioux have because uh, the science keeps being pushed at them. But they, but in the post-positive world, they're saying, well, you can't be 100% sure this isn't going to happen. And the answer is, that's correct. They can't. Probability is very light, uh, light, uh, low. If they've done their job right, which I don't have all the evidence. But if you have a pipeline versus trucks and tanker trucks carrying the crude oil, the chance, it's, it's just like, 
or you know, it's like anything. It's the difference between air travel, traffic, air travel, and automobile travel. You know, you're many, many times more likely. Thirty-three thousand people die a year in automobile accidents, depending on the numbers you look at, versus the average number of people who die in aviation accidents per year is about five hundred. When an aviation accident happens, of course, it creates a lot of fear and uncertainty, and it's very spectacularly played up by the media. But you can see that an airliner is much safer to travel than getting in your car. However, our perception is, I'm safer in my car because I can, again, I can control my own destiny, whereas in an airplane, the pilot and other factors are controlling my destiny, and I have no control over it, and that's the fear. So generally speaking, the pipeline system, <clears throat> if built properly, and from what little I know of it, it looks pretty good, <clears throat> is much safer than trying to transport this crude by truck. But the perception is, as Nietzsche says, this Nietzsche's idea of perception is it is a will to perceive, and people's will to perceive is, I don't trust you. If If you wonder why they don't trust you, all you have to do is look at the Deepwater Horizon event. <clears throat> the Deepwater Horizon was considered one of the safest uh, mobile floating oil systems in the world. And as you, we all know, it spectacularly just was blew up after a series, a chain reaction. You know, the law of unintended consequences. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it caused the death of several people and the mass destruction of the, of the Gulf of Mexico. So in light of this, this is one reason uh, people are very distrustful of the energy and oil uh, conditions in general, because they can point to this and say, well, you told us this was safe, and look at the catastrophe that happened to the Gulf of Mexico and the damage there. The other thing that people in business are not taking account of is the spiritual nature of the of the land of of the Lakota Sioux and this cannot be discounted it's easy to discount it uh, sorry I have a dog and a cat in a disagreement behind me uh, this cannot be discounted anymore culture spirituality religion it has to be taken into effect and to the Lakota Sioux this seemed to them this is an endless recroach, encroachment upon their right sovereignties from both the outer and inner worlds. And this has to be taken account of, and this I don't think was. I think it's a pot, one solution I offer is that when I worked for a, a company, uh, my previous company I worked for, when I was in Ontario, Canada, I'm from, I'm an American from the United, from Cleveland, we had a site in Ontario, and the majority of our general wage workers were from the local Ojibwa reservation area. Great workers, great people. And one thing that struck me when I went into the area where we had our machinery, large-scale machinery, is that there were beautiful medicine symbols painted on all the um, all, all the machinery, which was kind of fascinating to me. Because these were protection symbols to protect the workers and protect the business and make the business grow. I think in that idea that the Ojibwa had where I worked, there's, there's a, there's an, there's a way forward potentially between the protesters and the oil pipeline and the government. If we can bring the elders of the tribes together and we can say, look, we can protect the land and and use medicine symbols and other things to, to give protection, plus give jobs to the local people to, you know, patrol the, the, the pipeline to, to check it and to make it theirs. It has to, the, this project has to become the local people's project, not a project forced on them. If we can give the tribes and the people there who can patrol on in pickup trucks, on horseback, and they can do regular testing every day and give regular jobs to protect the U.S. infrastructure against terrorism or environmental destruction, that's a great thing. So that's a way forward, I think, that the Ojibwa showed me. The next concept is where I'm trying to get us to is red ocean versus blue ocean. And the red ocean concept, you know, strategy we have, 
competition, beat the competition. We're going to beat those protesters down. We're going to use rubber bullets. We're going to use, uh, you know, water cannons, pepper spray. We're going to, we're going to bend you to our will. It's not going to work. That's red ocean thinking. It's not going to work. We need to go to blue ocean, not a red ocean where it's bloodied from competition, but a blue ocean strategy. Create uncontested market space. As I said, if we can get the Lakota to accept the pipeline and help be part of the process to protect the land and protect the pipeline, that's a way forward. Making it part of the spiritual dimension, somewhat how the Ojibwa did to the machinery I worked with, and get away from this competition. The forces, the law forces need to back off. They need to back off from this. They need to stop using pepper spray. They have to stop using water cannons. The, the, the violence has to de-escalate immediately. We've got to get out of Red Ocean strategy. We've got to get people to a bargaining table. The Harvard concept, the Harvard University concept of the Socratic circle, where we have an inner circle of the two sides can talk. There's an outer circle of observers, and they can be from both sides. And then I would add the third hoop outside is the media and the general public so that we can have this dialogue to build a solution. So we have the two sides in the middle. We have the independent, we have observers from both sides around who are just there to observe. And we can interchange. We can move people around. The outside is the media, academia, um, uh, scientists, uh, the medicine men, spiritualists, religious people who can also add to this. We have to get to this kind of the Harvard concept of the Socratic circle in a three layer to help get a dialogue going. The wounded knee, uh, the two wounded knees, lives long in the Amer in the in the Native American psyche, um, and this is can, this is what the people fear. We have got to get through that and show them that, that we respect. And not just lip service, but we really do respect their wisdom, their culture, and their insight, and their angle of perception they can give us. <clears throat> the website here is the Pipeline and Hazard Materials Safety Administration on the U.S. Department of Transportation. If you look at their manifesto here, they basically are trying to Here's their mission statement. And you can see they have a strategy here of their values are trust, honesty, respect, integrity, valuing people, effective communication. So I would call upon the U.S. Department of Transportation Safety. I think, in a way, the PHMSA, they should take the lead here. They should look at their own mission statement, promote continuous improvement in safety performance, invest in safety innovations and partnerships, build greater public and stakeholder trust. That's the key right there. This is the trust that people don't have. And so they need to step forward. So back to the Washington Post article. We live in a, as I said, we live in a post-fact world. Water, you know, is the greatest resource of it's a, it's a, it's the source of all life on earth it keeps me from coughing the we my my plea is the december 5th deadline that should be moved to a from a deadline it should be moved to a discussion we need to have a discussion the socratic discussion that the harvard business school has to, that's what we use in business we have a business problem, you sit in a circle, just like the, the, the hoop that the Sioux talk about, the broken hoop. We need to reformulate that hoop. We need to sit in the circle, two sides discuss, discuss respectfully with dignity and respect, move forward. Outside, we have the other, other people who can put in their feedback after this discussion goes on. The third is the, is the scientists, the spiritualists, the religious people, the environmentalists, who can give independent observation of what they see, this three-layer approach. Present that, and I think that's the way forward. I give a plea, do not try to move in on those protesters on December 5th. It will be a disaster.